Good morning, church, and welcome to our online Sunday service for May 17th, 2020. My name is Mark Kwong, and I'm currently the pastoral intern here at Chinese Baptist Church of Central Orange County. Before we jump into God's Word, why don't we spend some time worshiping together with a song called Build My Life, which is about building our entire lives upon the solid rock and foundation that is Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, worship team, for leading us in this time of praise. Let's start. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save.
Thank you, worship team, for leading us in a time of musical praise to God. Let's begin this morning's message. My sermon is titled, Knowing is Doing. And this is part of a greater series where, as a church, we're studying the entire book of James, start to finish. And from previous messages, we know that the book of James can be very theological. But arguably, it's also very, very practical. Because the author, James, was concerned about godly living. You see, there were brothers and sisters in his church at the time that were very, very knowledgeable and intellectual about God, and they professed to be true believers, but their actions didn't show it. Either they weren't doing the right actions, but more often they were not doing anything at all. So in this morning's passage in James chapter 2, he's looking to bridge those things together. Faith in God, but also works for God. To remind us that godly living is very important and it's the best way that we can show others in the church and others in the world that we are true believers in Jesus Christ. So that's where the name knowing is doing comes from. It's because our central theme this morning is that knowing God also means to do good works in his name. So if you have your Bibles, please grab them now and turn to James chapter 2. We're looking at verses 14 to 26. Here's the first few. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. I highlighted some uh, key phrases there in this passage to hone in on. We have to ask ourselves when we read this passage, what's the problem here? Why is James writing this? You know, he's not just writing it for the sake of writing, but there is something going on. And the issue that was going on in this church that applies to us very much today is that there was this thing that he labels dead faith. And this is in opposition to living faith. And of course, living faith is where we want every Christian to land. But what was going on was this dead faith. What scholars think happened at his church was that even though a lot of brothers and sisters there repented and rejected the Jewish way of thinking where we just have to do the bare minimum, maintain the law, kind of like the Pharisees that Jesus encountered, where we look so clean on the outside, but on the inside, we're not truly doing this for God. We're only doing this for ourselves. Even though these Christians or professed Christians in James' church rejected that notion, they took on a new idea where, oh, you know, works don't really seem to matter for whether or not somebody is saved. So let's just stop doing any sort of work and just sit with our theology, knowing that, you know, as Paul writes, that salvation comes from grace through faith. You know, there's nothing about action in there. We don't have to do anything in response to that saving truth. And James here, his main point is to say, no, that is wrong. Yes, salvation is from grace through faith, but Christians still have to take action and do good works to show genuine faith. So he's trying to oppose this notion of dead faith being okay, where you just sit there idly with your head knowledge about God but not doing anything, and we need to move from that to a living faith, where we, we have that head knowledge, but we're also going out into the community, into the world, and doing good things for those who need it. And that's what this passage actually speaks directly into because our picture here is there's somebody, a brother or a sister. So he's talking about a fellow person in your church, okay? Not just anybody. They're poorly clothed. They're lacking in daily food, which means they don't even know when their next meal is going to be. What help is it if we say something like, go in peace, 
be warmed and filled. Or if we just say to them, God bless. You know, yes, those are very compassionate words. They do have meaning. But what good is it if we don't have compassionate action that's paired with our compassionate words? And I'm not accusing anybody of doing this because I am guilty of this exact same thing of just walking by somebody who's in need and just saying, God bless, thinking that that will fulfill uh, their requirements or fulfill what they need in life. James is saying, no, that's just, it makes no sense. That's a dead faith, right? To just say something nice, say something compassionate, but not physically offer them or serve them clothes that they need or, or food that they need and meeting those things. You know, that's not what a Christian does. That's not indicative of a living faith. Somebody who does that has a dead faith. That is his main point here. Why is that important that we make this distinction? Okay, why is it important that, okay, so we don't just say God bless to somebody, but we also give them food if they're hungry, or we give them clothes if they're naked. The reason why this idea of dead faith versus living faith is important, why it matters is because one saves and one doesn't. And it's not hard to figure out which one is which. A dead faith does not save. Only a living faith saves. So somebody who has a dead faith would do this kind of thing that we see here in James chapter 2. A person with a dead faith would say, go in peace, be warm and filled, but not give the brother or sister anything to be filled with. But somebody who has a living faith is somebody who would say those words, but also provide and tend to the needs of the brother and sister. And that person has a living faith. So very, very crucial to understand this concept because it's indicative of somebody's salvation. Once again, whether or not their faith is genuine, this is how we kind of tease that out, you know, how we do compose ourselves, how we take action in response to the truth that we've internalized. Another problem that he's trying to address is this test of works. And it's not really so much a problem, but he's introducing this idea of this test of works is really what brings everything else that we learn about from Jesus together. Okay, this question of how do we know that somebody's faith is genuine? The answer to that is by their works. You know, something that's very interesting is to think about how the world views the church today. And I've talked to so many friends and families uh, family members even, and just strangers on the street about what their thoughts are about Christians in the church. And the number one thing that I hear them, them say when they respond to this question of, what do you think of the church, is that we're hypocrites, that we don't practice what we preach, and that it doesn't do anything for the world. And even though we, to an extent, shouldn't allow that to rattle us too much, there is truth in that. And I think the reason for that is because of dead faith, this exact thing that James is writing about in his letter. So many of us go to Sunday, go to Sunday service, we listen to the sermons, we worship, we pray, but we don't do anything with that. We just sit in our chairs, we check off the box, and we're done for that week. You know, how many of us are actually responding to the things that we learn about in church and actually going out there and serving the needs of other people and taking action. This tells me that the world doesn't see the church doing that, and that's a huge problem because that's us being disobedient to what we read here in the Word of God. So that's an issue that kind of reinforces the idea of dead faith not being God's intention for the believer. This is actually a really controversial passage in... Um, amidst biblical scholars, which is kind of interesting. So I'm just going to do a brief uh, a mention of what's not the problem. So we know what the problem is, but what's not the problem? And what's not the problem here? What James is not addressing is the idea or the theology that works save you, that a person can be saved through the works that they do and the amount and quality of the works that they do. That is not true. That's not biblical. And that's actually not what James is speaking into right now. And we know this because James himself actually addresses this 
in uh, the first chapter, verses 17 to 18, where he attributes all these gifts, all the works that have happened that work towards our sort of salvation to God. So all that comes from above, it's not from things that we do. So he's not contradicting, contradicting himself or what somebody like the Apostle Paul says. And we have to know this too, this is a healthy reminder. Water baptism doesn't save you. Growing up in church or growing up in a Christian family doesn't save you. Going to seminary or being a pastor does not save you. And now they're just going to church or serving in church. None of those things save you. The only thing that saves you is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, which is orchestrated by God himself. So the cross, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the only thing that saves you. No other work that we can do as a human right here on earth can save us. We fully rely on God for that. You might be wondering, is it possible to have works without faith? And if you really think about it, absolutely. There's so many people, billionaires, celebrities, um, that give tons of money to charity. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but they're doing works without faith if they're not Christian. Um, they're doing a lot of things that appear good, but without faith, it means that the person is still not saved. So that's also something to think about. But here we're concerned about those that have a true faith, but are not doing anything about it. The second thing that's not the problem is Paul the Apostle. James is not writing this content to oppose or to disprove what the Apostle Paul wrote about in his letters. Okay, um, In fact, he actually does the opposite. He matches Paul quite well in his, uh, in his writing. And we know this from Ephesians, a good example of this. In chapter two, verses eight through 10, Paul talks about salvation and very, very directly. And I'll read those really quick for you guys. In Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, Paul writes, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Very straightforward. And this is not your own doing. It's not something that we can do. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So Paul is very clearly saying that the only way that salvation has come to mankind is by grace, and that's through faith. It's not by works, so that nobody can brag about it or say, I'm saved because I did so much. But what he does say in verse 10 is that we are made for good works. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. So this is what I like to call a necessary consequence of salvation. For a person who is saved through Christ Jesus, they can't help but have an outpouring of good works and service and love to those around them. This reminds me also a bit of Romans 12. We won't turn there. But in Romans 12, Paul talks about the marks of a true Christian. Okay, there's these exterior outward evidences for whether or not a person is genuinely saved. And James speaks into that exact same concept. That somebody who doesn't have those things, doesn't have love, doesn't have any care for anybody around them, especially the needy, somebody like that just you don't know if they're the real deal or not you know and that's the only way we can tell really um, so Paul and James would actually agree on this point that good works are a necessary consequence for a true believer somebody that has a living faith and not a dead one lastly this is not new information actually um, this is the last part before we move into the next part of the passage this is not brand new. Jesus himself talked about it. We won't read them here, but in Matthew, he talks about this extensively, that works will not save you, but also the importance of doing good works, that when we serve the least of these, we're serving Jesus. Are we obeying that command? Or are we just sitting there and pretending like it's not in the Bible? That's something that's very, very convicting, but very, very clear that Jesus says, if you're doing this for those in your community, you're serving me directly by doing those things. So don't be somebody who can be lost or be very, very fancy in their words and in their compassion 
in speech, but also be those things in action. That is what Jesus commands us to do, and that is what a living faith looks like. Let's move on to the next verse in verse 18. James goes on to say, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Once again, I've highlighted some very key phrases there. Once again, we have faith in works. And the second one, even demons believe. Very, very striking wording there. James is saying that it is ridiculous to separate faith and works. They are not separate things. Like we just talked about, it's, they're closely related. Faith produces good works, okay? It's not like, oh, I have the gift of faith and then you have the gift of works and we just kind of do our own thing. Every Christian has faith and they have works, okay? When he says even the demon, demons believe, this is such a great way, such a great analogy of illustrating that point, that they're not these separate things. He's saying that even demons, you know, spawn of the enemy, are enemies believe. In fact, they have amazing theology, demons. They're probably smarter um, in every way than any pastor or any theologian or scholar that has studied the Bible their entire lives. The demons know the truth about God. So that being said, so like, what does that mean? What, how does that make a difference? Okay. Demons believe in God, but the difference is in their response. They know exactly who God is. They know the Bible. They know the truth. But their response is hatred and opposition, opposition towards God and his people. And that's the key difference. For those of us that know the truth about God, we are like the demons in that we know about, we know about God through theology, through our study of the Bible, and through a genuine relationship. But our response is not hatred towards God. It is an immense and overflowing love towards God and love towards his word. So therefore, shouldn't we be obedient to his word? Shouldn't we listen to what he commands us to do? And through our love of God, shouldn't we love people around us so that that person who is poorly clothed and hungry can have their needs met through our love of God? He's saying here that simple head knowledge about God is insufficient because even the demons have that but what they don't have is true salvation because their response to that truth and their actions towards that truth are not godly that's something that the christian has that the demons don't i've been in seminary for about four years now okay and uh, it's been a wonderful journey, and I wanted to go to seminary because, yeah, I want to be a pastor, but I wanted to be, I wanted to be equipped to be a pastor and, and know how to do that job well. And I believe that's a very God-honoring thing to do for anybody who feels called to ministry. But something that was very interesting is that when I was first entering seminary, one of my friends who rejoiced with me that I was feeling called into church leadership told me that I should read a book. And this book was called How to Stay Christian in Seminary. And I was really confused at the time. I'm like, why do I need this book? You know, I am going to seminary because I'm Christian. And the reason for that, and I cannot stress this enough, is that going to seminary can be very, very dangerous for your faith because the Bible sort of ends up becoming a textbook. And we have a lot of books that we read in seminary and we go in with good intentions, right? We wanna to go to seminary to study the Bible, to make our whole life about being committed to what it teaches. But trust me, and anybody who's been through school knows this, when they assign you homework, 20 page essays, you know, 10 sermons, you know, a month or whatever, it can be so easy to kind of get a lesser 
image of the Bible, a lesser picture of the Bible. It just becomes a textbook. I just want to get my homework done. I just want to finish this essay. I just want to finish this sermon. And it's so, so dangerous. And some people actually leave seminary for that reason because they hate the way that it kind of dilutes the Bible when you present it in the classroom as kind of just like any other resource. But also some people deeply study the Bible and they lose faith because they discover things in the Bible that they didn't know were there before. And they disagree with what it says sometimes. And when they disagree with it, they leave seminary. And as the book is titled, How to Stay Christian in Seminary, sometimes they leave the faith entirely, which is immensely tragic. And in my experience, this has been so true. Sometimes the Bible feels like a textbook, a means to get my homework done. And I fight so fervently against that point but it's true, okay? So that's why I always pair seminary with church. Because church is the place where you can have a platform to serve other people, whether it's your fellow church members or people in your community. And that always brings the word of God to life for me. And that's just, it's a really good illustration for me and for other people that seminary edifies head knowledge. But a lot of the time, it does not edify our ability to do good works. So what has really kept me anchored this whole time is that church has always motivated me to do good works. And it reminds me of what James is teaching here, that the head knowledge is not enough. You have to go out, you have to be obedient to God's word and make disciples, serve your community, serve your church. That's what the Bible commands us to do, but that's also what a living faith is looks like. The seminary is wonderful and all, but head knowledge does not necessarily mean that you have genuine faith. Let's move on to verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Okay, so here we, James introduces the biblical character, the patriarch, Abraham. And remember, James is writing to the dispersion, so he's writing to Jewish, a Jewish audience, but specifically those that were living outside of Israel. And something that really remained consistent from Judaism to Christianity is that Abraham is just an absolute hero of the faith because he's literally the father of the faith in terms of he started this whole, he was the first patriarch that God has appointed to bless all the nations abundantly. And Abraham is a prime example of showing genuine faith by his works. Because remember, he took Isaac up to the altar under order by God to execute his own son, okay? And this was a test for Abraham that was issued by God to show God that Abraham truly had a, a real faith. How else would he have been able to assess that, right? And yes, it's a very extreme example of assessing a true faith, but this is why James praises and uses Abraham as an example of this, because he outwardly evidenced his righteousness. That yes, Lord, I believe in you now. I have turned from my sinful ways and I'm on this path of righteousness. And let me show you that that's true about me, okay? You told me to bring my son up to the altar and to kill him. And I trust you that much. My faith goes that far that I would even do that for you, Lord, because that's the most important thing. And I'm gonna show that by responding to your order and, and listening to it. And he actually does it. And we know that Isaac is spared. But through this action, Abraham's faith is highlighted. We are called to do that exact same thing through our actions. See, they're not these separate things but they're very intimately connected. Interestingly though, in verse 25, we find another biblical character 
from the Old Testament that James introduced. Let's read. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Now Rahab was not an Abraham, okay? So I love how James brings Rahab into this picture as an illustration of how works are a necessary part of faith. Because Rahab was no, you know, a Jewish patriarch, no, um, you know, he wasn't Abraham who was just, you know, super exalted in the Jewish culture and the Jewish religion. Um, Rahab was a prostitute, somebody who was very lowly, scorned by society, very, very low status. But even somebody like Rahab, who has been anointed by God and used by God, can be declared righteous. And it was through her works. It wasn't by her just sitting there silently, not doing anything. It was displayed by obedience to God's beckoning and following through by action uh, with what he ordered her to do. And what Rahab did was house a couple of spies who were kind of scoping out the strength of Jericho's army. And when soldiers came to capture the two spies, Rahab was just like, oh, they, they went that way, you know. And she protected them, despite being um, somebody who was an enemy of Israel. So James is saying here that Rahab the prostitute was also, like Abraham, justified by her works when she received the messenger to the spies and sent them out secretly by another way. So it's not like, oh, you know, so nobody can say Abraham, of course Abraham was a good example because he was so, so blessed by God, so anointed, and he was a biblical patriarch. You see, even somebody like Rahab showed that she was righteous by her actions. So connecting those two people of very different statuses is just immensely powerful and meaningful to us as we read it this morning. In verse 26, I highlighted the word spirit because this is kind of the third illustration that James uses to show dead faith or what living faith might look like. So Abraham was the first example, great example of living faith. Rahab, Another wonderful example of living faith. And the third one, he says, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. And spirit can also be translated actually in Greek as breath. So he's saying that just like a body that has no breath, that is no longer breathing, is dead. It's just a corpse, right? We can't breathe. If our lungs collapse, we're gone. In the same way, Faith apart from works is dead. So the relationship between faith and works is just like how breath gives us life. That's how closely associated they are, right? So don't separate them into thinking that one person can do faith and one person can do faith, uh, one person can do works. The faithful person does works. So it's wonderful illustrations by, by James. As we close our time here together this morning, and it was really, really fruitful, I hope, for all of you listening, remember, just kind of to sum it all up, doing works, okay? And what are works, right? In the context of this passage, works really hones in on the actions that show compassion to other people. So a good work in this case would be feeding and clothing those that don't have those two necessities. Okay, so those specifically are works that we should be keeping in mind. Those types of good works are evidence of having a genuine faith. Okay. Something that I always make sure to ask new believers, um, whether you're young or you're older, is this question. Because now that you have been saved and that you believe in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that he died for your sins and was resurrected again by the Father so that death could be overcome and that you're forgiven 
for your sin because of that sacrifice, what are you going to do about it? I always make sure to ask some version of that question. Now that you know the truth about who you are and the truth about God, what are you going to do about it? When I first became Christian, unfortunately, nobody really asked me that question. So I thought it was sufficient to go to church, to pray to God every night before bed, to go to Bible study and to fellowship. I thought that was it. But no, we have to ask ourselves, because we know the saving knowledge of Christ and we've internalized it, what are you going to do about it? God tells us so many things that we should be doing through Jesus. We should be making disciples. We should be serving the poor. We should be serving our brothers and sisters within our church. There's so many actions that need to be taken that evidence a true, genuine faith. So that's something that I, I posed to you guys this morning. A question, what are you going to do about it now that you know Jesus? Now that you know God through him, what are you going to do about it? Something that we also need to do is to reverse our church culture, okay? So what I mean by that is that the culture of the church, um, it kind of lingers. The dead faith that James is talking about in his own congregation is still very much present today. So many people profess Christianity. They say that they know Christ, um, but they're not doing anything. They're not taking action. And a very important related passage that I want to read to you is in John chapter 13. And Jesus is instructing his disciples about how the world is going to come to know that we are truly disciples of Christ. And that's in John chapter 13, verses 34 to 35. He says here, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And here's kind of the kicker. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How can we love other people if we don't love our church family first? So my exhortation to you this morning is use that love, take action, you know, show what love looks like by our good deeds and our good works. And let's start by loving each other within the church so that we know how to love people outside the church well. And Jesus says here himself, that's how the world knows that we are the church, that we are the true church that follows the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ by us loving one another within the church first. So let's do that. And there's so much room for that to be done, isn't there? I think we would all agree on that. And lastly, I know times are weird right now. You might be wondering, Mark, why are you preaching us a sermon on doing uh, good works and taking action when we're all sheltered at home. We can't go out and do anything. And I would argue that, I mean, that's a good point. You know, our ability to perform action and good works is very limited right now due to the current circumstances. But until we meet again, use this time to prepare for when we do meet again. Because what I would love to see in this church, I'm sure the whole pastoral staff would agree with me, is that once we get back together, when things kind of settle down and we can meet again, every person should have this living faith and should be excited to display their living faith to the world and to the people around them for the glory of God. Because this is what James is reminding us to do. Um, and it's so, so important. So in this time, which is really, really different, I know, but it's also very special, spend time with God. A lot of us don't have the usual distractions of work or uh, meetings or even going out to hang out with friends. We don't have those things to take up our time. So use this time wisely to pray, to read scripture and grow more wisdom in the scriptures and, and to spend time with the Lord. And when we do meet again as an in-person church, I hope that you're really excited to just exercise that faith to turn that head knowledge into practice and into good deeds for the glory of God. Um, we got to take advantage of these opportunities to bless other people. Uh, and there's so many opportunities to do that. We should not just be sitting here and growing our 
intellect, but not doing anything about it. So why don't we pray? Uh, in this time of prayer, I want you to reflect on the things that we learned today through James chapter 2, about how a faith without works is dead, and where you are on that spectrum. Some of us might feel like we're associated more with a dead faith, but we also know the process of how to get out of that rut. How do we get towards a living faith? How do we pair faith with works? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, your, this passage this morning. We thank you for the ability to meet as a church, even though we're not together in person. And Lord, we thank you that we have such a clear understanding through scripture of what it looks like to be somebody who has faith in God, but also be somebody who is willing to do good works. And Lord, that's exactly who we want to be as a church. We want to reverse the church culture that uh, where everybody on the outside sees us as a church that just does nothing. No, Lord, we want to be an active church where we read the scriptures, we know you, Lord, and as a result of that, we respond with actions. We serve those in our church. We serve those of us um, that are outside the church who need food and need these life essentials. The church is a vehicle, Lord, for us to show your love to the world. And God, we pray that through the Holy Spirit, you would give us the ability to do that, especially when we meet together again. May we just take off running and just be more than willing to be selfless and serve those around us so that your love and your message of the gospel may be known to those who don't know it yet. We thank you, Lord, for including us in your grand plan um, in this world. And we know that you're at, at work in each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord. May you bless this congregation and the rest of this Sunday for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church, for tuning in, and I'll see you guys next week.